patience, but it, it's not hard to be patient when you have good friends to be talking with and when you have good food to be enjoying. But this is what we've been waiting for, for Pastor Brian to share about serving. And so would you give a big hand? We don't do that in worship, but now we can give you a big hand. Well, Pastor Stephen, thank you. And uh, it has been a pleasure for my wife, Deb, and I to be here with you today. Um, and again, uh, we'll probably try to wrap up here around 1230, maybe sooner, do a little Q&A at the end. Um, but it's been a real honor to be with you. Uh, I think, uh, talking to your pastor, serving is one of the strengths of this yeah. church. And uh, I was on your website and listened to some of his uh, vlogs, and uh, it just seemed like uh, a real strength. So I was excited to talk to you today about, about serving. Um, I, I failed to mention in the service, uh, you know, I pastored at a GT for 33 years, and um, three years ago I retired from pastoral ministry, and I now work at Pennsylvania Adult and Teen Challenge. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's a recovery ministry. It helps people that are battling. Um, they want freedom from addiction, uh, alcohol, drugs, and so forth. Uh, I lead the pastoral team there. Um, I help raise some funds for the ministry because it is a nonprofit and helping a lot of people. We have partnerships with Department of Corrections and just helping people that are battling that. So uh, it kind of fits in well with my story. Uh, so I, I just wanted to mention that to you. We're really grateful. Um, but today we're talking about serving, all right? And uh, we do have some handouts. Um, I, it seems like some of you already got them. So we'll look at these later. And this really isn't going to be... Um, part of what I talk about, something for you to read later. These are just things that I did when I pastored. Uh, if you want to take notes, maybe you need to pull a pad out and jot a few things down if you want to. I've got a simple presentation here, but um, we'll uh, go ahead and, and dive in, all right? Um, I told Pastor Steve, too, I really do just want this to be a conversation. So, man, if you've got a question, you have a thought, if you're a team leader, of one of the ministries here at uh, St. Paul's, I, we would love to have interaction. And I, I said I might pull Pastor Steve into it to give his perspective as uh, your leader. Uh, so please, don't, don't just feel like you got to sit and listen. This isn't a sermon. Um, so let's talk together, okay? Does that work for everybody? Yes. All right, super. Um, well, let me, I'm not a techie. I was a baseball player, and this is <laughs> Wow, so it's not moving at all. That's interesting. Well, let me try it this way. Wow. There you go. Okay. Well, make it 1235 in case. We're <laughs> okay. um, but I love this quote from D.L. Moody, and here's what he said about the Bible. He said, every Bible should be bound in leather, shoe leather. Uh, I mean, D.L. Moody was long before you version and everything, being on an iPad or on a cell phone, but um, it really is about serving. It's not just, I mean, thank God for services and worship and and uh, the all those things, but really, it's serving. And, I, and I'm and i assuming I'm looking at a lot of the leaders here at St. Paul's. I, I love talking to Pastor Stephen about the history of the church, 1754. I mean, think about that. I, I, I spoke at a Lutheran um, church anniversary of 100 years, and here's what I said. If your, your first pastor had a powdered wig, that's a lot of years. That's a lot of God's faith. What? What's that? <laughs> that's right. Um, I could use a powdered wig, but, uh, but that's a different sermon. But anyway, um, just think of the faithfulness of God to this church over all those years. So, I mean, that's really what we're talking about. And again, as we serve and are faithful in what we're doing, then future generations, God willing, um, will be able to have the same kind of story. So the context, I'm going to share a scripture just to kind of open up and give a context for serving. And I don't even know that I need to read it all, and we'll see if I can really make the PowerPoint move. But Matthew 20, um, this is just a few weeks ago. Like, what is it? Is it the fifth Sunday after Easter? I saw that on the, the board, the fourth Sunday. So a couple of weeks ago, we were celebrating Good Friday and Easter. And in Matthew 20, here's what Jesus says. And Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside, notice this, privately, and told them what was going to happen to him. And I won't read all of it, but if you just skip down, he was going to be betrayed by Judas, obviously. They will sentence him to die. He said that the Romans, he will be mocked, flogged with a whip, 
and crucified, but on the third day, he'll be raised from the dead. So he's telling all the disciples this privately. He said, here's what's going to happen to me, all right? And uh, obviously, this is what we think about Good Friday and Easter. Now, immediately in the next verse, verse 20, so I don't know how much time passed. I don't know if he told his disciples and turns around and there is the mother of James and John. Um, but it was seemingly in a short you know, time span. Then it says, right after he's predicting his death and all that he's going to suffer, you know, right after that, it says, then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. She knelt respectively to ask a favor. I'll just put this in context. You know, I used to always say when I passed her, we got to put a flesh and blood on the Bible. You know, think about it like if, if we were in this context. And Jesus said, what is your request? She replied, in your kingdom, please let... To, uh, please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you. Sounds like a good mom, right? She comes to Jesus and says, look, I want you to remember my two sons, and I, I want my boys to be placed in a seat of honor with you, one on your right and the other on your left. But Jesus answered by saying to them, you don't know what you're asking. Now listen, when Jesus says to you, you don't know what you're asking, there's a hint. Like, <laughs> yeah. You should have known that before you ask him, but hey, he just, you know, he's being graceful, I think. Uh, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering that I'm about to drink? And notice their response. Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, they replied. Yeah, we're able. Okay, point number two. He's giving you a chance and you didn't get it. You know, you don't even know what you're asking. Now he says you're going to drink my cup of suffering. All right. He said, you will indeed drink my bitter cup. And he goes out of verse 24, he says, when the 10 now, so now they have that interaction. When the 10 other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. And they weren't, I, here's my belief, I don't know, this is the Brian Cuck version, not the King James, so easy does it. But they weren't indignant that they were asking something that they shouldn't have been asking Jesus. I think they were indignant because, well, who does she think she is? Her son on the right and her son on the left. What about the 10 of us? Who are we? That's just my interpretation of it. They were indignant. But Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, listen, it will be different. It'll be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man did not came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for others. Mm -hmm. When Jesus pulls it all together, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Where am I going to sit? Am I in a place of honor? Oh, this kingdom. The other guys were upset. Well, who are we? Are we nobodies? And now your sons are going to be? And Jesus said, listen, it's different among us. This is the way the world thinks. Mm -hmm. This is the way the pagans operate. If they have authority, they want you to know who's calling the shots. I'm in charge. It's really funny. Uh, we were at a wedding last week, and I was talking to an attorney, and I just, we were interacting, I asked him what he did. He goes, well, I'm an arbitrator. And he goes, the, the deal about that is, he goes, I carry the big stick. Whatever I say goes. And I was like, wow, okay, good. <laughs> and it's just interesting. But isn't that kind of human nature for all of us? I, I'm not, you know, criticizing the, the attorney. We're all kind of that way. We think about ourselves. But today, um, we're talking about serving. Um, a little bit later, and again, this was a common theme with the disciples. They, they would have these interactions of like, you know, who's in charge or who's number one? Uh, Jesus said to them in Matthew 18 on another occasion when they were, you know, bickering about this. He said, that's when he called a child to his side and warned his men that unless they became like little children, they would have no part in his kingdom. So Jesus turns things upside down, doesn't he? he uh, what's common and what's normal in the world of who's in charge, who's got all the authority, who's calling the shots... And, and think about it even in church, like with budgets and ministries and serving and reaching the community. There's, there's authority in this church. You have a pastor. Sure, you have a board. Um, and so that's a part of church organization. But I think what we're talking about today with serve, it's, it's our mindset. It's how do we serve and how do we serve one another, all right? Um, so I'm going to use um, serve as an acrostic. Um, kind of make it, I think, hopefully more memorable. And this was this was actually a message I preached, I don't know, 25, 20 years ago at GT, because this was one of our strategic purposes, which I'll talk about in a minute. So if you're jotting anything down or whatever you want to remember it, here's the thought. The, um, the acrostic, the S, stands for this. 
and I believe for churches, that there's strength in sharing one vision. All right? Um, we need we realize, obviously, serving in the church, that we're just under-shepherds. Like Pastor Stephen, he's an under-shepherd. You know, the great shepherd is Jesus Christ, and he serves this church and the community. He and his wife serve this church uh, like I did as under-shepherds. And so God's word has the ultimate authority. God's word is the most important word for us to to really understand. Um, and, I, and I really do believe, and I was, I was sharing with him during the lunch, that I was in uh, leadership in the denomination that I served for a number of years. And we were talking about this church, 1754. The, the age and the length of service that it's had is an amazing thing. But I did see churches that were started, maybe a church plant, and then they didn't survive, or people stopped coming, or there was division, and they just didn't. So we do see churches that don't last. I mean, even the New Testament. You think of uh, the, the book of Colossians, or the Thessalonians, Thessaloniki. Um, those churches don't exist. So churches do have a lifespan, all right? Uh, I think it's amazing, and you're to be, it's an amazing thing how, what God has done to bless this church. So it's really cool. But again, you have um, a, a vision. So let me ask this. Um, how, many, how many of you think you know the vision of St. Paul's? Raise your hand. You've got it word for word. Yeah. Carol, you got it? Let's hear it. I would think it would be our, miss, our mission uh, statement from the church. Me and his wife and mission St. Paul's, and I can't do the whole thing. Well, I'll tell you what, you're doing good. Keep rolling. <laughs> <laughs> Justice. We got the bulletin out, so that's helping. Yeah, that's cool. I'm gonna tell you right now, that blows me away because I went on your website and I looked at it. What a great mission! I love that. But I thought, I wonder how many of the people at St. Paul's know that. Like it's in their heart. Like they really know what that is. I'm, that's amazing. Uh, Carol, God bless you that you would even volunteer to do that. And you guys all started talking. That's really cool. I'll tell you why. Because when I used to teach a little bit of this at GT, I would say, you know, most businesses have a mission. And I would say to them, you know, how many of your business, and they'd all raise their hand and say, who can tell me what the mission of your business is? And they'd be like, well, I don't know, something like, you know, the customer's always right, and we want to make a lot of money, or they would tease it, obviously, but um, they didn't quite know it. So I was really impressed by um, your mission. There it is, okay? I love it. So I, I just kind of broke it apart. Like if I had bullet points, number one, I thought number in its life and mission, which I love that. It's not just the mission. It's not just a piece of paper in a filing cabinet. Uh, it's not just something, hey, well, we've been doing this in 1754. We've been around a while. No, it's the life of the church. And I believe a lot of life in church happens as we serve. So I love that thought. Um, then I looked at the number one. the number one thing is worship, what we did today, to worship the triune God. All right, that's, everything flows out of that. I mean, if it's not about God, um, it's kind of like the disciples messing up. Who's in charge? Can I sit here? Can I sit there? What's my role? No. Uh, God is the one who gets all the glory. So he's the one that we worship. So I love that part of it. Then I love this. Proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Which again, your pastor, I know every week, preaching the word. I love the preacher school. You know, even when he's on sabbatical, there'll be others that are proclaiming God's word. That's what the church does. Um, so I love that part of your vision. And then this was so cool. Practicing loving service. Not just once in a while, but practicing. It's a lifestyle. It's the lifestyle of this church. So I was really in touch by it. Embody God's reign and peace and justice, which is good. How many know our world needs some of God's peace and justice? I mean, turn on the news. You know, it's funny. I Teen Challenge, I'm often speaking on the weekends about addiction and about... And I've had pastors tell me, well, we don't have that problem in our community. <laughs> and I would just say, well, time out. Uh, just check out your social media and tell me if you, you know, addiction is not prejudiced to anyone. Uh, it affects all of our lives. Whether you are battling addiction or where you're affected by it the way I have been and many of you have been too. Uh, so we need to embody God's justice and his peace. And I love this. Establish a Christian community. And that's what you are. Here in Douglasville, in Weavertown. You are that. And uh, so that's awesome. Um, 
a big verse for this would be uh, about vision would be where there is no vision, the people perish. And I love that you guys were reciting your vision. It's not just on your website. It's not like some, well, you know, something about God. No, you were articulating what it was. And that's a key to serving. Now, um, I'm going to put this up there. Uh, the ministry health cycle. Uh, I can tell you this. There are many churches that really are not, and I'm going to say many, but there are some churches that really aren't following their vision in a strong way. Okay? So how do we know if we're a healthy church? So one of the ways is, it starts here, I don't know if you can all see it, but it starts with a dream and a mission. So I don't know when that mission was written. I don't know if the founding fathers in 1754 said it. I would love to know if the guy in the powdered wig said, you know what, here it is. Do you know Pastor Stephen? I don't. So it's such a great mission, but that's where it starts. At GT, for example, we started in 1923. I think that was like in your third building program after the Lawn Cabin. So we're like newbies, you know. Um, but five women started our church in the city of Reading in a prayer meeting. But they had a vision, okay? Um, the second aspect of that is that beliefs. And I would say this about serving. It's not just doctrine. I mean, the UCC has good doctrine, and what we believe about the Bible is, is critical, um, but it's really not only that, but when it comes to serving, it's not just what we believe about the Bible, it's what we believe about people. Every one of you have a purpose. You know, like we said today, we all have a story. God's made you for a purpose. You're not just a number. You're not just, oh, one of the people that go to St. Paul. No, you're a unique person that God created, you know, talking to Tom, talking to Judy about their life, and I could tell by looking at him, he was an athlete, and, uh, you know, just you, you've been created that way, all right? So what you believe about people, and I love the vibe of this church. I mean, I, I said to the gals, I don't know what's on the menu for next week, but Deb and I might come back if I'm, if I'm not preaching somewhere. I mean, I just love the feeling in this church. It's, it's a good thing. So beliefs. Uh, and then goals, okay? What is our goal? We, we should all have goals, you know, goals, whatever it's, you know, what we're doing with the offerings, how we can impact the community. These are all important things. And then strategy, because um, life and ministry change. I mean, think about it. I don't know what this church was like in 1754, but they didn't have cell phones. How many remember your first cell phone? Yeah, mine was like a car phone. <laughs> and it was like the size of a shoebox. I could barely hold it with one hand. I'd be like, and then I would always say, yeah, I'm in my car. Um, think of how the world changes and technology. But what does the Bible say about Jesus? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God never changes. So how do we adapt with that in church? How do we serve our community and reach our community, right? Um, if we're doing all that, then it becomes a healthy ministry. Um, now, what if we go down the other side? All right? Church, like people, may have good years, some bad years, maybe different things going on. Nostalgia. Who can tell me what nostalgia is? Anybody know what the definition of that is? Of course, you can Google it now on your cell phone if you want to. <laughs> I'd love to get, I mean, Carol nailed the mission like that. Bam. <laughs> Who can tell me what nostalgia is? What was that again? Remembering the past. The good old days. We've always done it that way. We've always done it that way. That is amazing. I, you know, that's funny you say that. Because the one thing I, I don't tend to be like a dictatorial leader, but I told our board, here's one thing we can never say in my 33 years. We never did it that way before. Because, well, yeah, well, then when would we ever do anything new? Remember the New Testament church? They didn't always have deacons. You know, they were feeding those widows the, their little tuna fish sandwiches, and they ran out of, you know, again, Brian Cuck version. You can read it later, but it's, it's really there. But then they created the deacons because then the apostles could stay in prayer and the word. So what if they just said, well, we never did that way before. We're not going to have any deacons. They can get their own tuna fish sandwiches. <laughs> right? Great thought. The good old days. How it used to be. Remember back in 1754? Yeah. You know, I wish Pastor Stephen would wear a powdered wig. I miss him. <laughs> He's like, Brian, it was nice having you. You'll never be back. But thank you. Uh, nostalgia. That, that starts that. Then when it goes farther, then it becomes questioning. I mean, when I played baseball in the White Sox, um, if we were off on a Sunday and in another town, I'd, we'd go to church. A couple of us, we'd hop, you know, get a taxi, go to the church, 
And sometimes you'd walk into a church, and I had all these new visitor packets because we were new visitors everywhere we went. But you could tell, like, this side is with the pastor and this side of the church isn't with the pastor. We're questioning. Okay, is this really what we should be doing? They were, um, you know, they became polarized. So that's the unhealthy side. And again, I don't sense any of this. And then, of course, there's a drop in growth and there's a change. And then that's what can lead to a church dying. Um, and so, again, I just think, so what's the prevention? The diagnosis of that is, what's our strategy? Like, how are we reaching people in Weavertown, in Douglasville? What are some things we can do to encourage people to be a part of our church? Um, the cure would be our goals and our belief about people and say, hey, you know, uh, and again, I feel that here. I just feel the friendliness and the kindness, and that's a big part of it. But again, it goes back to the vision and what are we called to do. And I, but I love, I love, again, your vision that we're about worship, we're about serving, okay? We're about God's justice and his peace. That's what we do at St. Paul's. And man, when you can live that, uh, people are going to sense that, all right? Um, you know, we talk about life's difficulties. When you go through stuff, I was talking to Sandy and, you know, people, you've been through accidents and different things, but yet they see a piece about you. Um, they're going to ask you, where, where, where do you get that hope? Where do you get that trust? You know, and then that's an opportunity to talk to them about God and certainly to invite them to St. Paul's. Um, so the mission and vision. Um, one thing I would add to that, I was just going to share with you the values. Like, I don't, I don't know if you guys, I didn't look closely on your website. Maybe you do have them. But, uh, for example, the values, um, the mission is who we are. Then the values, this is how we think. Because, you know, I would think most churches have a similar vision. All right? When I pastored, um, we created some of these things. Like, here was one of our values. Um, we're not just churchgoers. We're Christ followers. All right? Um, second one would be this. Uh, we change our methods, but we never change our message. So we're letting people know, look, things do change. We're, you know, we've done this for a long time, but uh, I don't know, maybe now we need to adjust because the community is different. But the message of God's word never changes. Uh, another one was we give God our best because he gave us his. How many know that, all right? Yeah. Uh, and that's what I sense here at St. Paul's. Uh, we value people because people matter to God, Amen. right? We take our mission seriously, but ourselves lightly. So yeah, and we're all about worship. We're all about serving, but I'll tell a couple bold jokes because, you know, hey, I do part my hair in the middle, you know, and I, so we're just, there's, and that, again, I appreciate that. I'm not, this isn't flattery. I'm being sincere in my appreciation of your leadership and of you that serve. Like, there's, there's a lightness here. There's a, like, you'd want to come back to this, right? I mean, the yogurt bar alone would draw me back to St. Paul's and, and then just the kindness, you know, so uh, it's really cool to see um, we seek to be known by what we're for, not what we're against. I love that about a church. Like sometimes churches, well, don't do this, and you're a sinner, and boy, you got to change this. Let's let them know what we're for. We're for God. We're for you, all right? We're for you finding what God has for your life. Um, we exist for your purpose, not your preference. Now, how many have a preference? Let me know if you have a preference. Okay, about three of us do. <laughs> so let me ask it this way. How many of you like ketchup on your hot dog? Put your hand up. Okay, I'm putting my down because I don't. How many go mustard and onion? That's the way I roll. Yeah, okay. So we all have a preference. And in church, we come, we have a preference. But what it really is, it's not my preference, oh, the music, this or that, or I hope we use the yellow table covers. It's, it's really, it's what is my purpose before God? That's what the church, that's what St. Paul's wants to help people find, for sure. All right? Um, one of the things I also do in the vision, and again, all my points aren't this long, so don't get nervous. <laughs> it's writing a win statement. So when you think about serving, so who can tell me, voluntarily tell me, what, what's one area where you serve? You serve on what team? Anybody? Missions. Missions. Music. Who's with Martha? Music. Choir. Man, that was so good today. You know, so you serve. So what I encouraged our teams to do was to write a win for how do we know for winning? Because as a baseball player, like I know last night the White Sox got crushed by the Phillies. How do I know that? How do you know who wins a baseball game? Come on. You, know, you watch it, but even then, if you watch it, how, how do I know really who won? Scoreboard. Scoreboard. The bottom of the ninth, you have more runs than the other team, right? In church, how do we know if we're winning? Growth. Yeah, growth. Maybe, yeah. Maybe the offering gets bigger. There's more people here, you know? Um, we reach a lot of people. Right? So sometimes, I guess what I'm saying is sometimes it's harder to know the win in church 
than maybe it is a baseball game. So I would have our teams write a win statement. And for example, I'm gonna, I, so I started new at TC three years ago. And here's the win statement that we wrote out for advancement. Here's what we wrote out. Understanding, creating, and enhancing relationships with faithful and potential donors to ensure current and future funding for PATC. Just a simple statement that we would write out. Now again, the music team, the missions team, those are just, those are just some things to think about, all right? Um, you can do this later, but some of the team questions would be, uh, how are our serving teams doing with our vision? I mean, I, I'm still blown away that you guys rattled off the vision and mission as well as you did. Many times when I share that, it's like, well, I don't know. But that was so good. Uh, or where could we improve? All right, on to the next one. The E of serve is embrace excellence. Um, so personally, when we embrace excellence, it's character, it's integrity, it's our thinking, it's our personal interactions. And again, I just feel such a healthy vibe here at St. Paul's with that, all right? That's our personal excellence. Um, the Bible talks a lot about striving for excellence. Paul talks about it in Philippians. In ministry, excellence would be in fulfilling the strategic purposes. Now, today we're talking about serve. But when I pastored, one of the things that I would talk about, we had five purposes. It was reach. How are we doing in reaching our community? That's one of our purposes. Then once they come, how are we connecting? All right? Um, there was a couple that said hi to us in the parking lot. They waved and said hello. That, to me, is a good thing. Um, sometimes the church I went to on occasion when I was a kid... You know, when we did go, it was on the right in the fourth pew. We sat right there. Um, and I'll never forget, one time before we became there enough, the lady said, well, you're sitting in my seat. <laughs> and my dad said, well, I didn't know this was your seat. So we moved back a row. Um, I don't think that's a good way to connect. I would just, that's just my take, right? So connecting is just being friendly. And, hey, how are you doing? And, uh, yeah, I'm glad you're in my seat. Enjoy yourself, you know, whatever. But um, so, so that's important, all right? Um, so connecting with people, being friendly, you know, connecting. Hey, how are you doing? What's your name? Hey, join us for the serve training or whatever. And then serve, what we're talking about today. And then follow. Um, I also co-author co-authored a book called Follow, which is about making disciples. You know, it's not just about becoming a member of a church, which is a big step, but it's about being a follower, a disciple of Jesus, all right? And then leading, you know, and I, again, I said, probably you guys are a lot of the leaders here at St. Paul. So um, that's a big part of excellence, all right? So when you're talking about serving with excellence, you can ask these questions. Where are the strongest points of excellence in our church? Now, I would add to that model of, you know, reach, connect, serve, follow, lead. Building is a big part of it. Finances are a big part of it. There is a business side of the church. I, I mean, I understand that. So, um, like, I, and I saw, like, your facility looks beautiful and you maintain it. You know, that's a big part. So when people, I, I remember one time I told a pastor the front sign at their church, and they were doing their best, but the paint was chipping. It was really old. The grass was not mowed. And I thought if I was driving by, I'd think, I don't know that I would want to go there. So excellence in your facility, like you have at St. Paul's, I think is, is a big part too, all right? So we can talk about how we would improve that. The R of serve uh, would be recruiting and retaining uh, volunteers. So that's kind of what we're talking about here today. And here's what I would say. I used to say to the church, I, we would never get up in, in when I pastored and said, you know, we are really hurting. We need someone to like be the Sunday school or Christian education teacher for our junior high boys. Can somebody please do that? We wouldn't make an announcement like that. You know why? Because it sounded a little desperate. Like, boy, these junior high boys, nobody wants to do it. But, well, one of you want to do it? Come see me after the service. Like, they'd be like, that's the last thing I'm going to go do. <laughs> I would say that you guys are the best people to do that. To say, hey, I serve with the junior high boys. They're great kids. I'd love for you to help me with it. Or, hey, I'm in the music department. We have such a great time in the choir. We enjoy the singing. Man, and I've, and I've heard you sing in there. But you're good. Why don't you join us? You are, you're the best ones to... Now, Pastor Stephen can say it. And he can preach it. And as a leader, certainly he's going to do that. But when you ask someone to serve with you or come alongside what you're doing and what you love, um, that's, that's, a, that's a great thing, okay? Um, I, you know... For example, I mean, I, this was a sermon that I preached, like I said, 20 years ago. Sir, these were the points. Um, here's what it's interesting about volunteering. Peter says this, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. 
faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. So uh, I'll never forget talking to a gal, and she said, well, Pastor Brian, she said, listen, she goes, I don't, I don't have any gifts. And I said, well, I know that's not true. I mean, I know you're, I'm not saying you're lying. I'm just saying God says he's given us all gifts. Now, maybe you're not aware of what the gift is. Maybe you've never discerned. And at GT, we used to use a thing called Uniquely You, and it would help you kind of discover what your spiritual gift might be. Um, so I knew she had it. Um, and one of the things we used to use there, it was called Shape. Uh, this was from Rick Warren. Maybe you've heard of him from a uh, church out in California. Um, and he used this idea that God has shaped us to serve. All right? And so you break that down. is like, what are my spiritual gifts? All right? Do I have the gift of teaching? Do I have the gift of serving, encouraging? And it's mentioned in all those chapters of the Bible. But what is my spiritual gift? Because, again, I think your spiritual gift becomes like your job description for God. And so knowing what those are, heart and passion. What am I passionate about, you know? Um, passion about baseball, passion about playing golf, or passion about singing. Uh, what's your passion? You just enjoy doing it. And I sometimes made the mistake of, like, we'd have a teacher that, you know, taught in a local school like Ole, Boyertown, wherever, Muhlenberg, Governor Mifflin. You would think, oh, they, they would want to teach. I'll never forget, a teacher said to me, she was, Brian, that's the last thing I would want to do in church. I do it eight hours a day, and I love it, but I want to serve you know, in the guest services, or I want to sing or be in the choir or the worship team. So it's what you're passionate about. Your abilities. You just have natural abilities, all right? Uh, your personality. So how many in the room are introverts? Raise your hand. You're an introvert. <laughs> now, some of you are introverts, but you're so introverted, you're saying, I'm not raising my hand. <laughs> so I know we have more than two introverts. My dear lovely wife is somewhat of an introvert. She's friendly. <laughs> She might go. Right. How many extroverts do we have? There we go. So personality, that, that does affect how you serve. I enjoy working with people. I'd like to do something quiet in the office. I'll do whatever. So that's that's the point. And then experiences. Um, that's what you've gone through. All right. It's what you've experienced. It's what you've done in the past. And so those are you know good things to also consider. All right. Um, let's see what else I want to cover here. Well, we'll just look at some of the team questions. Um, here, here would be something. So many times you say, well, do I know my top three spiritual gifts? What are they? That's a good way to, to start understanding. How has God shaped me to be involved serving here at St. Paul's? Uh, how do you find and follow up with those who would like to serve in an area of ministry? So, for example, in our church, I know when we built the new building, we had a certain number of volunteers, but we knew we were going to need a lot more. And this was the time I preached this message and I'll never forget, it was a really powerful story. Um, we had this like clear tube on the, on the stage, and there were these orange balls in it. And we, those were the things that uh, represented how many new people we needed to step up and serve. And it was a lot. And I'll never forget it. Um, the, the invitation that week was to say, if you're, no, if you're not currently serving, and probably most of you here are serving, but in the church, most of them, some of them were not serving. And I'll never forget a guy coming up, and he reached in the tube, and he got a ball, and he took it, and, and then we actually had a person on our team that their whole ministry was helping people get into the right role of volunteering. Well, it was probably eight or nine weeks after I preached that message, and I will never forget this. This man walked up to me. He said, Brian, he said, um, I'm still not serving. And he pulled this orange ball out of his pocket. He said, but I think about it every day because I, I do want to serve. I just don't really know what I'm you know, called to do. I don't know what would be the greatest need. And then we had a conversation, and then he started volunteering in a role, like helping with our building. So um, I think those are just some good questions for you guys as team leaders uh, to talk about. Two more, and then we'll take a few questions, and we'll be done. Uh, part of serving is just valuing people. It's not about just getting things done, checklists and whatever. It's just people matter to God, and so they matter to us. All right? Uh, I One of the things I always struggled with it and God finally you know dealt with me about it like after the service you know you're out there talking greeting people shaking hands whatever and and, and somebody would be telling me just like an intimate need like maybe a physical struggle they're going on and then somebody behind it would be going waving at me and then early on I would be like waving back and I thought no I just need to be present right here this person's telling me about their need I'm not going to be like oh yeah hey and what was that oh okay yeah yeah all right. I just felt like God said Brian you just need to be present you need to be talking right to this person. And if that person gets upset because you didn't wave back, well, 
I'll deal with that later. Uh, so we want to value people, all right? Uh, a generous man, Proverbs 11 says, will prosper. He who refreshes others will he himself be refreshed. What a great promise, right? Um, and I think of all the one another's in the Bible. Um, I'm going to do a short sermon on all of these. So <laughs> Pastor Stephen said we're good till about 4.30, so I'm sure we're good. These are all the one another's. Wash one another's feet. Love one another. Love one another about four or five times. Be devoted to one another. Live in harmony with one another. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Have, I don't know why I read that one. Have a <laughs> equal concern for each other. Greet one another. Think of all the one another's. I used to say to my church, this I love looking out here. To me, like it's harder to do the one another's in a pew, shoulder to shoulder. It's nice doing it at a table, isn't it? Because you see each other. You can do all these one another's. Again, that's only the first sheet. There's another whole set of one another's here. Uh, pray for one another. You know, clothe yourself with humility uh, with each other. So those to me, that you can't get better at valuing people than that. Here's what the Apostle Paul said. Nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And I'm like, wow, what a statement. Who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself, uh, made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. All right. Um, so some of the team questions you could talk about at some point. In what ways are we valuing your team? So... What we used to do around Valentine's, on Valentine's weekend, because that can be a stressful day, you know, if you're married or if you're dating, but if you're single, I remember being nine years being a widower. And I, oh, Valentine's, okay, yeah, whoopee-doo. I'm not dating anybody. And I remember, you know, I, I really will say this, going through what I went through, and my wife went through some things too, it made me a more sensitive pastor. I said years ago as a young preacher, when I first started, I said, well, if you don't have a Valentine, go out and get a Valentine. What a bad thing to say. And the young girl came up to me. She said, Pastor, do you, and, and I always said, look, if you want to talk to me, something I didn't preach right or whatever, come. And she said, it really hurt me when you said that because I would love to have a Valentine. I was like 26 years old when I became the lead pastor. I had a full head of hair too, but I didn't have a, a powdered wig. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to look into that. I'm sure Amazon has one. Um, but I, I should have never said that. All right. I should have never said go get a Valentine. That was a really unkind. And if now when I'm a widower and I have no one, I wouldn't want that to be said to me. So valuing people. Uh, but we used to on Valentine's do uh, we love our volunteers. And it was just a day to honor those who serve in the church. And so maybe there's ways, you know, you do that with your teens or whatever. Uh, thought. So final thing, we'll wrap up with a couple questions and we'll be done. True servant leadership and ministry is not about what we do. I mean, it is part of what we do because it's serving. It's helping the church look better. It's helping the choir sing. And, you know, so it is what, it's really about who we are becoming and who we are. So experience growth. That, I'm not talking about the growth of the church. I'm not talking about new families coming. I'm talking about you sitting here. Am I experiencing growth? Am I becoming closer to God? Am I growing in my faith? Um, I mean, there were pastor, uh, people in our church, obviously, that were older. I mean, they had heard more sermons than I had ever preached in my life. But they were growing, and they were vibrant. They were excited to still serve God. Here's what Paul said to the Thessalonians. He said, this letter is from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. We are writing to the church in Thessalonica. I can skip down. May God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Dear brothers and sisters, we can't help but thank God for you because your faith is flourishing. Mm -hmm. I love that. It's growing. And as we serve God, because sometimes we can get serving and doing. It's what I do for God. But we're personally not growing. And I think God would say, no, as we grow, our ministry comes out of our growth in Christ. So just a thought of experiencing growth. And maybe some questions could be, what are you doing to grow personally? Um, are you helping your team grow personally? Maybe before you start with your ministry, you have prayer together and say, hey, I, I love today that in your service, you prayed individually for people and you shared needs. So you could do that in teams before you start working on the building or singing or doing missions. You could pray for each other. And those are just good ways to help you grow. And now the screen is blank. And thankfully, the pastor's wife had got working to begin with. Uh, any 
comments or questions as we wrap up? Anything you want to say? Your ministry or what you're doing? Or... Yeah, Carol? That's right. People we see. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That, that's such a, that's a great self awareness point that you made. Like, because everyone has strengths and weaknesses. Churches, people. As a baseball player, we had, I had strengths and weaknesses. So I was a high school player, drafted. I was a good catcher. I had a good arm, good defensive catcher. But going down there as an 18 year old facing four year college guys, I wasn't the best hitter. And one day, the catching coach came up to me, Sam Harrison. He was a big leaguer at one point. He said, Brian, he said, I want to talk to you, son. I said, yes, sir. He said, um, you know what you remind me of? I said, no, I don't. He goes, Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, some of the guys would, like, push off on him because he just he was an older guy. But I, I liked him. I said, I'm starting to think. I'm going, like, Kentucky Fried Chicken, your finger licking good. I'm going through all this stuff. Like, I said, well, Coach, like, Coach Harrison, why do I remind you of Kentucky Fried Chicken? He said, well, you know what their, you know what their vision and motto is? He said, do one thing and do it right. He said, I know you can't hit. <laughs> but he said, you're a good catcher, and you got a good arm. you got to do that one thing and do it right. So I love what you said, that when you look at these questions of where do we have strengths at St. Paul's? What is our strength, and what are some areas that we can grow? Um, and I, I probably should have put, rather than weakness, it's a growth area. I love that. So, man, we're really good at this, but when it comes to reaching or evangelism or sharing our faith or telling our story or just inviting someone to church, um, you know, that's a, that's a great insight. That's really, really good from a missions perspective, for sure. Anybody else? Yes. Many women here would like to deepen your personal faith and your understanding of the gospel. The women's Bible study is starting a new unit. We're going to look at the book of James um, Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock. You are more than welcome to join us and learn more about the Bible and what God is calling you to do. That's awesome. And it's Martha, right? You're the, yeah, that's awesome. So not only singing, but teaching the Bible and James, you know, putting our faith into action. Uh, what a great, what a great thought. Yeah. Yeah. about that. Yeah. How can we as a church encourage other members to take part in that and want to, to do that? Yeah. Yeah, well that's a that's a good thought. Um because we get the same battle at GT. Like I would I would preach a message on serving or spiritual gifts. Uh and that's why we kind of lean toward doing the uniquely you. Like I, I I forget back in the day it may have cost us five or ten bucks. I don't know. But we would do it kind of in a setting like this. It was more of a class. Like, one of the things we had was, if you were new to GT, like you just started coming, maybe you're coming two or three months, we did something almost like this once a month. All right? It was called GT in 60. So if you were new to the church, we didn't have a breakfast like this. I can tell you that right now. Uh, I don't know what we had. A couple oranges and maybe a banana, but it was nothing like this. So you guys are way ahead of us there. But we'd have a little get-together right here, and we'd say, hey, if you know, and some of our of people that were serving would be here too, but we would just have conversation, we'd talk a little bit about our kids' ministry, our ministries, and then um, one of the things we would do is we would, we paid for it so that people didn't have to pay for it, but if they wanted to find out their spiritual gift, uh, we would give them the link to Uniquely You. So it was really good for people to say, well, I have the gift of encouragement, or I have the gift of teaching, or... Um, it was just really well done. So that, I think, becomes more of a strategic initiative, probably with the church. Um, but that, that's cool. And it's good that you've done that. That's, it's neat. It's so available today. Again, they weren't doing that in 1754, but it is just neat that it's available now today. That's a great question. Anybody else? Maybe one or two more, then we'll turn it back to Pastor Stephen. When you say recognizing your gift, it's just not necessary for you to recognize your own, but when people reach out to you and recognize the gift that you you have that you're not utilizing to the fullest, is to 
let you know that and, and support you and maybe add and motivate to use your gift. That's really, really good, Tom. Um, I, you know, that was another area where God really spoke to me. Like, I always wanted to be encouraging and thank people for serving. But I, rather than just saying, like, I remember God just kind of impressing upon me. Like, I would say, hey, I really appreciate you serving what you do. But it was just kind of this pat on the back, kind of broad. But I think what you said there, too, is like being really specific in your appreciation. Uh, or maybe to a younger person. I used to always say GT. Now, I'm going to turn 60 in a couple weeks. But I think we need to hand it off to the younger generation. I think it's nice to say to a young guy, young gal, say, you know what? You know what I really appreciate about you, whether, you know, whether it was playing a, an instrument or whether they were serving or helping in our kids' ministry. Like, be specific when you appreciate someone because it can make people, we don't get a lot of that in this world. You know what I mean? I mean, my mom was from the South. So down there, you'd pass somebody on the road and the farmer would wave at you. You wave at your neighbor sometimes, they think you're weird. You're like, weirdo? Like, what are you doing? Like, but I think just giving a nice word of appreciation and encouragement can go a long way, Tom. You're exactly right. And certainly for you, yeah. Mike? I, I think what you said is absolutely the truth. Because a lot of times, people do not see in themselves what we see in them. That's right. And if a good leader or a good mm -hmm. person to lift somebody up, you've got to help them see the good in themselves. That's exactly right. That's well said. And that, that's so true. Because like you'd often say, like if I said... How many of you think they're a leader? Raise your hand if you think you're a leader. <laughs> yeah, and going to Mike's point, four or five, raise your hand. We're all leaders. You lead your family. You lead whatever you're leading, your, your work. And here at the church, I would think a lot of you are leaders. And so your word of encouragement to them, like Mike said, would be powerful. Now, they expect Pastor Stephen to say it, and they would expect a guy like me to say it. But when you say, when you notice something specific in their life, the way they've served, or their humility, or I appreciate what you did, that goes a long way. So true. Now, when you talk about strength, when you talk about strength, because that's what church, like if you have one person in your church, yeah. you know what I mean? Just explain that, because that's what helps with the spirit. Yeah, that's a good point, uh, Deb. Uh, you know, we, here's what would happen. I would preach a message like this, and you'd have people that would want to serve. I want to serve in youth ministry. And I'm not knocking our youth ministry. We had a good youth ministry. But sometimes team members didn't follow up with people. Like they really wanted to serve. Or maybe they did the uniquely you. And they, now they knew their spiritual gift. I think it was really important to have like, and we had one person that was their job. And you really wouldn't even have to have it as a job. Someone could volunteer at St. Paul's just to like oversee serving. And what you would do is that you would help people get the uniquely you. Help them understand where could I serve. Like maybe they're new. And how, if I want to help with the facilities or do landscaping or if I want to be in the choir, can you introduce me to Martha? And one of the things we used to do in that was it was a test drive because here's something I learned. When people volunteer, to, in other words, when they volunteer to serve somewhere, um, we would always do a test drive. So they filled out, they, they knew what their gift was, their passion was working with young people, they want to serve, they, they feel like they want to serve in youth. So what we would do is the surf coach would go with them over to the youth area, and uh, they would do the service. Now, here was the key. If they felt like after they had that test run, they thought, I don't know if this is really where I want to serve. You know what most people will do if they volunteer, and then they serve and they don't like it? You know what they'll do? A lot of times they not only quit that ministry, they leave the church because they're embarrassed. And we would say, hey, look, if it, it doesn't the right fit, that's okay. Maybe there's another area. So that was a big part of having that surf coach because they would help them find a ministry where they did feel good. And like, you know, I do. I love serving here. So that's a that's an important point. Yeah. That being said, this church is absolutely amazing. I am currently disabled through a health issue. I have health issues. And I always wanted to volunteer and do something. I couldn't find my fit. Yeah. Cool. We found my fit. And that's the best part is that everyone, without realizing it, found my fit. And then all of a sudden I'm like, okay. This, and it makes me, and I'm like, okay, maybe I can go farther with them, you have to see with my health, but I, I've never been in a church that they are more than understanding, yeah. and more, and even changing it, well, I know it was um, COVID that did it, but yeah. now we can watch online if I can't make it. Right. Like, oh. This church is just absolutely amazing with that. Yeah, that I is so wonderful. For others to continue to reach out to people, because yeah. it really made a difference for me here. That, that is awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that, because... <laughs> That's powerful. And, and and again, maybe you'd be one of the team members that would be on the serve team just to help people. Because we think about serving the choir, serving on missions, serving on the grounds. 
But what about the serving is just helping people serve, like helping new people find their right fit? And you said that very well, so that'd be a good thought. Maybe one more. Uh, I'm just curious, how did you find, you were talking about gifts, like how did you get your, where did you find your transition from your gift of preaching at GT to serving in a recovery program? Like when was it and how yeah. was it did you say, <clears throat> my gifts now need to be served to those teens that are going through drug and alcohol because that's so much in need of our youth. How did that happen for you? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I So I had been serving for 33 years and I, I always had my mind. I didn't want to stay too long. I've seen pastors stay too long and then maybe now the church. So the church was growing and we were still having effective outreach, but I just felt personally, I think a lot of it because I was a widower and um, I just thought, okay, maybe this is part of the change. So I, I pastored maybe four years after the accident, and it was going well. Um, and then just the long story made short is this. We did a, a retreat always with our staff. We'd go away, just have time of prayer and whatever, and we named it the Solitude Retreat. There was very little teaching, whatever. We did it up in a, a monastery in Wernersville, and we just got quiet. We had a journal. We'd sit there, and um, I just felt like God was impressing upon me that, Brian, if you trust me with your future, um, I'm going to direct you. And I just I felt that little, you know, I wrote it in my journal and uh, talked to our elders about it. Um, and then at one point I just felt like, you know, I was getting to speak other places even though I was the pastor. I was being invited to speak and over at the Reading Royals and doing different stuff. And, and so I just felt like, well, maybe this is the time. Maybe there would be a transition. Well, I was in a small group with other ministers, like would be Pastor Stephen, a bunch of ministers, and one of the guys that was in our group worked at Teen Challenge. He was the CEO. And um, I asked our elders, I said, look, is it okay if I just mention, like, I'm in this transition, pray for me? And he said, Brian, we're, we've been praying for two years for someone that would represent our ministry. My life story is addiction and the effects of it. And so now I speak in different churches every weekend. Um, it was a nice transition at GT. They got a pastor with hair and had a great heart for God. And it just was a. It ended up being a really smooth trend. He'd been my executive pastor for probably twelve years, and so it was just it was just a it was just God's timing. God's timing for sure. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, you bet. Well, thanks for asking, and thank you for having us. It was a pleasure to be here. I'll invite sure. Pastor one more. Our pastor Stephen.